Uh, Professor uh, Stokes Lampard, can you hear us? Oh, yes, I can hear you now. Hello, uh, good morning. A very good morning to you. Uh, my first question to you was uh, your reaction to a Prime Minister Theresa May's calls uh, that uh, GP practitioners should be open uh, seven days a week from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Well, I was certainly taken aback by the, uh, the headlines this morning and the reporting that has been made of what Mrs May said last night. Um, certainly there are some practices, in fact there are many practices around the UK that are open as we're speaking. Um, and I've been contacted by many GPs who are working extremely hard today. And the out-of-hours GP services are incredibly busy throughout the evenings and weekends. We need to be clear that all patients should have access to urgent general practice services 24-7. That's what the urgent services are there for and they are staffed by many, many hard-working GPs. However, the seven-day access to routine appointments is getting confused and routine services are different from urgent services and we need to be very clear that providing more routine appointments is unlikely to have any significant difference on A&E attendance at all because checking people for their high blood pressure and doing their routine diabetes check is very different from seeing people who call in saying we, I am sick today and who may or may not need to be referred on to hospital. Uh, just looking at the figures that we have here at Sky News, they really illustrate a National Health Service that is clearly under uh, incredible strain, especially at this time of year. It's January, it's winter. Uh, more than 40% of hospitals declared a major alert in the first week of this year alone. Dozens of trusts issued operational pressure alerts due to bed shortages on wards and overwhelmed A&E departments. The number of alerts put out on the first six days of this year was more than six times higher than in the previous six days. All this at a time when we're seeing GP practices not open full time, we're ha hearing stories of GP practices uh, open, taking lunch breaks that last for about three hours. There is a perception here from the general public that uh, what GPs are trying to do is to protect their weekends and to protect their lunchtime as opposed to helping a system that is clearly under a lot of pressure. This nonsense about three hour lunch breaks is just that. GPs are incredibly hard working professionals and certainly in my professional career, I don't know what a lunch break is. Most GPs do as I do and grab a sandwich while we're doing paperwork, making calls to patients or in between home visits. So I think we need to be quite clear about what the truth is and what's been conflated with the serious issue of winter pressures right through the NHS. Hospitals are facing terrible pressure, but so are surgeries. Unfortunately, surgeries don't have the capacity to issue a black alert or turn patients away from the door. So I think we are skating on thin ice when we're suggesting that GPs just aren't working hard enough. They are working to the absolute limit because at the end of the day, GPs and all the staff in our surgeries care desperately for our patients. That's why we do what we do. Some of these headlines about opening hours have been somewhat misconstrued because they're conflating times where the surgery front door may be shut while the GP's out on visits, while the whole team are having mandatory training, you know, life-saving skills training. Um, we're not being available and not working, and that's clearly not the case. There is far more behind the statistics than just the headlines, and I'm sure most patients will recognise that. Um, Yesterday, 1.3 million people in the UK saw a GP. What about this notion of uh, having funding cuts? I mean, the, the Prime Minister has pledged £528 million per year in funding by 2020. Is throwing money at this current situation, is that enough to rectify the problem? The issue of cutting funding, if somebody is not fulfilling on a contract they have agreed to, then of course you pull the contract. That is standard business practice and nobody would disagree with that. But using pulling funding from routine care as a threat is not going to help. If we have a service that is already stretched to the limit, where we don't have enough people, then actually taking money away from that will only make the situation worse. So I think we need to be clear about what the threat is about. Um, and not get distracted by it in terms of out of hours. You do get the sense here when you say there are not enough people that we need now a complete radical new approach to dealing uh, with GPs, to dealing with the NHS in general, um, which is clearly in a different position to how it was 50 years, 70 years. We need a complete overhaul of the current system. We do. We need some serious and difficult conversations. How much does this country prioritise having an NHS, having a service that is free at the point of need and universally delivered to all the population? 
If we wish to continue with our amazing NHS, we have to invest a higher proportion of GDP. We have to recognise that at the moment, Britain spends the lowest of G uh, GDP on health compared to all our neighbouring Western countries. Um, we need to recognise that we have fewer hospital beds than any of our neighbouring countries. We are an incredibly efficient way of delivering healthcare, but we have got to the precipice. It is time for those difficult conversations, I agree. Professor Ellis, thanks for that, Potter. Many thanks indeed for joining us.